All right, take your Bible this evening with me, if you will, please, and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. A verse, I'm sure, which is familiar for many of you here this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye, what's the word? Separate, Separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Uh, and I will... Uh, be a father unto you, and will, uh, ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord uh, Almighty. Father, this evening as we would dwell upon the need to separate from apostasy and heresy and error that is so prevalent, our God, help us tonight, and I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I am a fundamentalist, and I'm not ashamed to say that, I'm not ashamed to, to pronounce that, and I know some brethren are getting a little nervous about that these days, but I'm a fundamentalist. Now, uh, there are two pillars to fundamentalism. One is an adherence to cardinal, orthodox Bible doctrine. But number two is a separating or a willingness to separate from apostasy and heresy. And I was given a book by David Otis Fuller 35, 40 years ago. Uh, as you may know, I uh, was trained to be a smorgasbord Bible approach in the critical text and, and choose whichever one you want. And the thing that struck me in reading Fuller's book was the apostasy connected with the critical text. And I was a separatist then, and I'm a separatist now, folks. I wanted nothing to do with it, if for no other reason. We're going to talk about that tonight, and I, I realize what we're going to touch on here tonight is, is not new, but uh, I, I am uh, speaking more to the group sitting right over here, these younger people, than to you gray hairs and no hairs here tonight. <laughs> but uh, I think most of you preachers here tonight understand that in all of this issue there are Two competing Greek texts, if I can use that word. When my book, Touch Not the Unclean Thing, came out years ago and, and a benefactor sent it all over the country, uh, my phone began to ring and there were some un unhappy campers on the other end. And uh, one guy said to me, Sorensen, don't you know that the Greek says so-and-so, such-and-such? I said, which Greek? And here was a guy who had a seminary degree, a master's degree in in uh, theology or in divinity or whatever, and he didn't know there was more than one Greek text. But we're going to talk tonight about the apostasy connected with the modern critical text. I hold in my hand a Westcott and Hort uh, edition of the New Testament. And, uh, and uh, young people tonight, the King James Bible is based upon the traditional text, the received text, the textus receptus, they're all, they all mean the same thing, the TR, which is an abbreviation for Texas Receptus. And they're different. As Brother Brown said last night, things that are, that are different are not the same. Uh, but the, the critical text, which was launched through Westcott and Hort about 100 and, I'll say 35 years ago roughly, is associated with apostasy, with heresy, with blasphemy at every step of its history. And if for no other reason, and there certainly are more reasons than that, but if for no other reason, I want nothing to do with it. I'm a fundamentalist. And the critical text is a who's who of apostasy, heretics, and the two principal architects dabbling in the occult over the 30 years they were working on it. That is verifiable, documentable history. We're just going to touch on that a little bit here tonight. But let's just look at several phases of, of history as it pertains to the text of the New Testament. If we are, would go back to Alexandria, Egypt in the third and fourth centuries, that's the 200s and 300s A.D. In Alexandria, there was a quasi-religious uh, philosophy called Gnosticism. 
And it was very, pro uh, very prominent, very prevalent. Alexandria, Egypt would be to the, the religious world then uh, what Rome later came to be to the religious world. It was the, the, the religious center, the, the academic center, the, the intellectual center of the Roman Empire. And Gnosticism infested it. And uh, from uh, Alexandria, Egypt, came several manuscripts. Now, I don't believe that Vaticanus or Sinaiticus came directly out of, Sina out, out of, Egypt, uh, out of uh, Alexandria, I should say. Uh, but they were sourced. I mean, uh, Simonides had a source. It was called the Moscow edition, but it was an Alexandrian text. And who knows where Vaticanus came from? Uh, from the bowels of the Vatican, for sure. But Alexandria, Egypt, uh, was a hotbed of Gnosticism. And the Alexandrian manuscripts, or, or textual family, is whence all the modern translations find their root that eventually developed into the Westcott and Hort Greek text. And the, the Gnostics, as I mentioned this afternoon, uh, among other things, did not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. Therefore, they did not believe in the deity of Christ. Folks, that's serious heresy. That's serious apostasy. And I don't intend to spend a lot of time on that here this evening. But it permeated Alexandria. And it absolutely influenced the Alexandrian text. And if you know what to look for and, and how to look for it in the Alexandrian text, you really don't have to know Greek. You can just go to the, your, your, your friendly neighborhood NIV or <laughs> New ASV or ESV or, uh, or the alphabet soup of modern Bibles. And you know what to look for, folks. You will find a diminishing of, a, of the person of Jesus Christ. A, if you want to fancy your word, a diminution of the person of Jesus Christ, where his virgin birth is diminished. Maybe not eliminated, but it certainly is diminished. Where uh, the, uh, the eternality of Christ is diminished. Where his omnipotence is diminished. Where there is often a disconnect between Jesus as Lord or Jesus as Christ. The Gnostics didn't believe he was Lord or Christ. And so they were nibbling away and little by little changing the text. And that became the sourcing of what later came to be known as Sinaiticus and Alexandria, or, or uh, uh, Vaticanus, I'm sorry. There were several prominent Gnostics in, in Alexandria. One was Origen, another was Eusebius, and Constant. Uh, Constantine the Great called on Eusebius to produce 50 Bibles for the ch uh, churches of uh, Constantinople. I think the sourcing of the, of the, the, the critical text manuscripts are, are related to those Bibles that uh, Eusebius, the Gnostic, uh, produced for Constantinople. But the point is, the, the roots, the origin, are, have, have, a, have, a, have a, uh, a speckled history a history associated with apostasy. But let's move down a little bit further into to later uh, uh, religious history, if I can use that word. Back in the 18th century, a man in Germany by Johann Semler came on the, screen, uh, on the scene. I was going to say the screen, but they didn't have a screen back then. It came on the scene. But Semler was basically the father of, of German rationalism. Now, what German rationalism translates into today is liberal theology. The doubting and the denying and the questioning of anything supernatural or anything miraculous in the Word of God. And they questioned, doubted, or denied that the Bible is verbally inspired. And they certainly didn't believe in uh, verbal preservation. But Semler was the original German rationalist. A reliance upon the rationale, upon the mind, upon the intellect. And if the mind or the intellect couldn't get its arms around something, they rejected it. And it became the, the genesis, the beginning of liberal theology, which infests and infects our country, and for that matter, the entire world to this day. 
Well, Semler's had a student by the name of Johann Jacob Griesbach, who continued as a German rationalist. But Griesbach had the distinction of perhaps developing the first critical text. Now, he didn't have access to uh, Sinaiticus or Vaticanus, but he didn't like the, the received text of Erasmus. And, uh, but I, I, I bring up Griesbach, who was another liberal, another apostate, another rationalist, uh, because about a century later, two men that most of you have already heard the names today, Westcott and Hort, adopted the method of Griesbach and uh, their, in their biographies, we read whose name they venerated. They basically worshipped at the feet of Griesbach. And we'll get to Westcott and Hort here in just a moment. But their roots, uh, their uh, influence was similar in Griesbach. That's, that's telling. And we get a little bit further into the 19th century now, there was another German rationalist by the name of Karl Lachmann. Karl Lachmann tinkered with the text and toyed with the text and, and did textual criticism. But Karl Lachmann believed that the Bible is just another old book. To be treated historically and, and uh, academically like any other old book. Folks, that's blasphemy. He did not believe in the verbal inspiration of the Word of God. It was just another old book. And I, what, what I want you, particularly young people tonight, to pick up is that through this whole lineage that we're going to go through here and we are going through, there is one after another who are uh, connected to apostasy, connected to blasphemy, connected to heresy. Well, uh, in, in the latter part of the middle of the 18th century, the 19th century, I'm sorry, the 1800s, another German rationalist came upon the scene uh, whose name was Constantine von Tischendorf. Tischendorf. And Tischendorf is going to have a profound influence on this entire issue of the Bible text. Tischendorf is the guy who basically gave us Westcott and Hort. And Tischendorf, who by the way wasn't von, which means sir in English, but he wasn't that to begin with, but he later was benighted in, in Germany because of his textual work. But Tischendorf began with the premise that the text of the New Testament has been lost to antiquity. It's been lost to history. His rationale was that because we do not have the autographer or the autographs, the original writings of the New Testament, which is correct, therefore it's been lost. And his theory or how he had been influenced is that, and, and you hear it all the time in the, in the secular media today, well the Bible's been copied from copies from copies and edited and edited and we really don't know what it said in the first place. And that was the mentality of Tischendorf. Therefore, and by the way that's not true young people, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass right. away. Uh, neither jot nor tittle shall pass till all be fulfilled. Uh, Jesus said, the words are, aren't going to fail. A jot is the smallest character in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, a tiny little right angle mark. Uh, he said, that's not going to pass. A tittle is a part of a letter, uh, like the crossing of a T or the uh, the, the, the foot on a capital L. It's just a part of a letter. Jesus said the words are not going to fail. The letters aren't going to fail. Even the parts of the letters will not pass to all be fulfilled. The Bible teaches preservation. Tischendorf, of course, did not believe that. And he set out on a mission to recover and reconstruct the text of the New Testament. And so he was aware that there was a major repository or library, if you will, of, of manuscripts at a place called St. Catherine's Greek Orthodox uh, Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. He journeyed there, and you've all heard the, the story how he found a manuscript in a wastebasket. I don't believe that's true. That was part of the cover story he made up, the cover of his tracks that he stole it. But uh, uh, Tischendorf 
in, in, without going through all the details of 1844 up to 1859 and, and several trips there, but Tischendorf basically carried off this manuscript from uh, Mount Sinai. And uh, by deception, uh, by subterfuge, and, and frankly by outright theft, Mr. Tischendorf, von Tischendorf, I think was a dishonest man and he was a thief. That's pretty harsh language. Uh, I, I don't have the time to go into all the details tonight. Uh, much of it's in this book here. But <clears throat> that manuscript that he spirited out of Mount Sinai, he called Sinaiticus, the book of Sinai. Uh, and by the way, uh, Tischendorf is the primary dating source of Sinaiticus. No one else basically has disputed him, but he, he's the one who said this was produced in around 325 to 350 B.C. Do you know what the, the rationale or the criteria for that was? Because that document was written in uncial characters, uppercase letters, which uh, uh, passed out of, uh, out of being at about that time and went to the more conventional lowercase letters that we're accustomed to. And that's the, pri and, oh, and by the way, the, the, it looked kind of old. <laughs> now, uh, it's not my purpose, and I spent an entire message on it last year, but that, that manuscript had been fabricated in the year 1840 by a Greek by the name of Simonides, and messed it up and made mistakes all through it, and they were corrected, and, and, and it wound up there at Mount Sinai. And Tischendorf took it home and, and said, this is the oldest manuscript in the world, the oldest Bible in the world. The fraud was not on Simonides, the fraud was on Tischendorf. But careful study of his activities in the 1840s and 50s show a pattern of collusion, isn't that a good word? with the Vatican. He absolutely, positively was collaborating and colluding with Vatican authorities. And of course, while it, in, in so doing, he came upon another uh, manuscript there at the Vatican Library called Vaticanus. And by the way, just for, for what it's worth, uh, Westcott and Hort never saw Vaticanus. Westcott and Hort never saw, I'm, ta I'm talking about the actual documents, never saw Sinaiticus. A few others did. And you can see it tonight by going home and getting on the internet and looking up Vaticanus or Sinaiticus. You can see stuff there. The, Vatican, the Vaticanus online has only been there for three years, a little over three years. Um, but I digress. But Tischendorf claimed that these both were very old manuscripts. He therefore made a facsimile copy of, of Sinaiticus which before long made its way to London, England, to the renowned or perhaps the infamous Doctors Westcott and Hort, British scholars, there in the Church of England. And uh, meanwhile, through the, 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 the agency of the Vatican, Cardinal uh, uh, Angelo Mai saw to it that the Vaticanus was published, and that made its way to the Vatican or to, or to Westcott and Hort. But notice along the way we're talking about not only Gnostics, we're talking about German rationalists, uh, German rationalists who in some cases were dishonest and, and, and uh, uh, unreliable in their, their personal character. We're talking about leadership in the Vatican all being involved in this textual, textual history. Right. That puts some red flags up for you folks? It does for me. Well, let's talk a little bit now about the men in London, Dr. Westcott and Dr. Hort, both uh, uh, divines, men of leadership in the Church of England. And uh, Dr. Hort was a professor and Dr. Westcott was a, a bishop in the Church of England. And over a period of 30 years, they worked with uh, first Sinaiticus and then Vaticanus and collated and edited them into one cohesive text, which was released in 1881. And there it is, folks the Westcott and Hort Greek text of the New Testament, based at that time completely on Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. About 90% Vaticanus and about 8% Sinaiticus. 
Now today the modern critical text has had a little bit more added to it as other manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts have been collected along the way and, uh, and added to it. But let's just talk for a, a few moments about Doctors Westcott and Hort. In fact, uh, there was a, a perhaps a well-meaning, but I think a very misinformed brother who about uh, 18, 15 years ago wrote and said, I believe that Westcott and Hort are, were good godly brethren and we'll see them in heaven. Uh, well, first of all, they were voluntary members of the Broad Church Party of the Anglican Church. Uh, the Anglican Church uh, uh, of the late 1800s was a totally different animal than the Anglican Church of King James uh, I of England back in the beginning of the 17th century. And by the end of the 19th century, the 1800s, the Church of England was in the process of becoming completely apostate. They associated themselves voluntarily with uh, that element of the Church of England called the Broad Church Party. They were broad-minded you know, you and I are narrow-minded, <laughs> fundamentalists. But the broad church party denied or doubted the virgin birth of Christ. They doubted or denied uh, the deity of Christ. They doubted or denied uh, the bodily resurrection of Christ. They doubted or denied uh, that there is a literal hell. They doubted or denied that uh, there was a literal six-day creation. You go right down through the scriptures, anything that was miraculous, they doubted it. They denied it. They were liberals. Westcott and Hort chose to be part of that section, that segment of the Church of England. And again, as mentioned earlier, they venerated the name of uh, Jacob Griesbach, uh, one of the founding, uh, founders of, of German rationalism and modern theological liberalism. They dabbled in the occult. And we know that because both their sons wrote biographies of their fathers, and they both very clearly state that their fathers uh, dabbled in, in occult activities. They founded an organization or, or on the ground floor in, in England called the Ghostly Guild, today called the Society of Psychical Research. You can go on the internet tonight and look it up. And they even credit Westcott and Hort as being part of their, founder, their, their founders. Uh, Westcott and Hort uh, practiced the communion of the saints, which essentially was holding a seance in a dark church in the middle of the night, trying to raise the spirits of the departed dead. Folks, that's of the devil. Yeah. And all through those 30 years, they were uh, developing their, their new Greek text. They were messing around in the occult. And that is documentable, verifiable history. Well, coming to the other side of the ocean, to the United States, uh, in the year 1901, a, uh, well, back up, hit the, hit the pause button, hit the reverse button. Go back to Westcott and Hort. In 1881, they released their new Greek text. In 1883, they... Uh, were the, the primary translators and, and developers of what came to be known as the English Revised Version, the ERV, which had the distinction of being the first modern uh, English translation of the Bible from the critical text. It has come and it's gone, and most people today have never heard of it, uh, because most modern Bibles come and go. Uh, there, there's nothing permanent about them. But coming to America in the year 1901, a man by the name of Philip Schaff, who was a famous church historian, I might add a liberal church historian, was the, the organizer and the, the, the mover and shaker, as it were, of what came to be known as the American Standard Version, which was the first modern language translation of the critical text in America. When I was in seminary, we were taught that the ASV, the American Standard Version, was the rock of biblical honesty. Well, uh, it's based on the corrupt text, folks. We're not even getting into the eternal, internal problems of the critical text here tonight, just the, the, the externals of it, but nevertheless. But here is something interesting about Philip Schaff. He was the organizer of the World Parliament of Religions in the year 1893 in Chicago, Illinois. The World Parliament of Religions was essentially the beginning 
of the ecumenical one world church movement. And here is a guy that's giving us a modern language translation here in the, in, in, in the United States, the American Standard Version. Uh, my Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Seems to me somebody wrote a book with that title. <laughs> well, let's go back to Germany for a while. In the latter part of the 19th century, moving into the 20th century, there was a father and son team by the name of Eberhard and then Erwin Nessel. And Westcott and Hort had passed the scene, as, as all men do. And the Nessels, Eberhard and Erwin, continued the work of Westcott and Hort, uh, of, of tampering and tinkering and, and uh, modifying and, and, and uh, continuing to develop the modern critical text. So the manuscript or fragment would be found someplace, and they'd say, aha, this helps us reconstruct the New Testament some more. And another uh, fragment would be found someplace else. And aha, we need to incorporate that. And, and, and the whole critical text philosophy for, for the last 130 some years has been continually changing, or the, 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 its product is continually changing because they believe they are still recovering the New Testament. Yeah. They're still in court, uh, uh, reconstructing the New Testament. But again, it, uh, they are liberals. Uh, and so, Erwin Nessel would before long begin collaborating with, or shall, shall I say colluding with, began collaborating with a man by the name of Kurt Aland. And uh, we'll, we'll come to him in a moment, but uh, they together began to develop what to this day is known as the Nessel Aland Greek text. It is one of several flavors of the modern critical text. And of course, I think, and young people here tonight, virtually all of the modern Bible translations are based upon the modern critical text. There are several variations of it, several flavors of it. We're talking about Westcott and Hort. They had their text that Nestle and Aland are developing. A, a, and, a, and again, it's all based on Westcott and Hort. Overwhelmingly, it still is to this day Westcott and Hort's work. And, and going back to Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which goes back ultimately in its lineage to Alexandria in the, in the Gnostics. But today, the Nestle Aland text is in its 28th edition. That means it's been changed about uh, changed 28 times in about the last 100 years. Now, I, I, I write books and we publish books, and when a, a book goes into a, a, a new edition, and some of our books are in their third or fourth editions, it means something has been changed internally. It could be as simple as correcting typos. It could be changing a paragraph, changing mistake. Uh, maybe I came upon some new information and threw a little more information in, but it's changed. It's different. But here, the, the Nessel Alon text is in its 28th edition, folks. That means what they say is the New Testament, what they say is the Word of God has changed about 28 times in the last 100 years. I'll just take the old King James Bible and the received text. We can track it right back to the church at Antioch, and it ain't changed. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Well, uh, the Nestles uh, came and, and, and went, as, as all men do. And, but Kurt Aland, who was the younger of them, continued the, the work of, of developing the critical text in Germany uh, in the, the, the middle of the 20th century. Uh, by the way, along the way, Kurt Alon divorced his first wife and married an another woman by the name of Barbara, and, and she joined in him in his textual work, be that as it may. I have a picture of Kurt Alon sitting in an a easy chair with his legs crossed, puffing on a big cigar. But Kurt Alon was on the ground floor of the budding neo-Orthodox movement back in the 1930s. Uh, Neo-orthodoxy is just another kind of liberalism. Basically liberal theology, but using orthodox terminology. Neo means new. The new orthodoxy. And uh, Kurt Aland worked together with Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
and Karl Barth, or Barth, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, who were the, the founding theologians of neo-orthodoxy. And that says much about where Kurt Aland was at spiritually. And again, the, the, the connection here all along is of apostasy. Well, after World War II, you'll recall that uh, Germany was divided and Berlin was divided and the eastern part of Germany and East Berlin was communist and the, and the East German communists were more communist, I think, than the Soviets were. I mean, they were radically communist. Well, Kurt Aland went to work for the East German communists in teaching theology in a communist university. Now, if you can figure that out. But again, it gives some insight into where the man was coming from spiritually. And then he went to West Germany and continued to work there. Uh, and from there, uh, the, the Nestle Aland uh, 23rd edition, Greek New Testament, was produced, and from the 23rd edition came the New American Standard Bible. But again, notice the lineage. There is rationalism, there is unbelief, there is Gnosticism, there is liberalism, even sprinklings of the occult through all these editors of the modern critical text. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Well, let's come back to America. And a theologian in New Jersey by the name of Bruce Medsker uh, was rising to prominence in the middle of the 20th century. Bruce Medsker taught at Princeton Theological Seminary and uh, then became dean uh, of, of the seminary and eventually the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, which incidentally is one of the most liberal apostate seminaries in the world. Uh, and in, in studying the writings of, of Bruce Metzger, we find that he, we could call him a classical theological liberal. Bruce Metzger taught that there were four authors of the Pentateuch, the JEDP theory, the, the Jehovah, Jehovahist and the Elohimist and the Deuteronomist and, and the priestly uh, writers. Well, folks, my Bible says Moses wrote the, 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 the Pentateuch. But liberals, of course, discount what the Bible says. Bruce Metzger taught that uh, the, 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 the biblical account of the great flood was a local flood. Uh, he denied the Jonah and the whale story in the Bible. Bruce Metzger took the position that the book of Daniel is so accurate that it cannot be prophecy. It must be history. Well, it is accurate, but it's not history, folks. It's prophecy. It was Bruce Metzger who, back in the 1980s, in collaboration with the Reader's Digest organization, uh, produced the Reader's Digest Condensed Bible. Where, and, and Bruce Metzger, I might add, was the managing editor, and he chopped out 40% of the Bible, saying it was unnecessary. Folks, I mean, if you want to do that to Shakespeare, that's fine. If you want to do that to some other writer, that's fine. But you don't do that to the Word of God. But again, that is where Dr. Metzger was at. Well, uh, later on, and, and, and this committee I'm about to tell you about has had, had several changes and, and various individuals on and the committee, but Bruce Metzger, Kurt Alon, Cardinal, Cardinal, did he get, get that? As in Roman Catholic, Cardinal uh, Carlo Martini, Ellen Wickgren, Matthew Black, all liberals, went uh, together, came together to form a textual committee of the United Bible Societies. And that committee varied with some other names over the years, but, but nevertheless. And from the United Bible Societies came a new Greek text, again based on Westcott and Hort, called the United Bible Societies, the UBS text. And from the third edition of the UBS text came, uh, for example, the NIV, the New International Version. But, uh, and, and, and the difference between the Nestle Alon text and the UBS text is slight. It, it's very, very slight. And they have since uh, combined together to call it the NU text, N for Nestle and U for UBS. 
And if you read your New King James Bible, or if you get a New King James Bible, particularly one that's a little nicer, you, you, uh, the, the hotel versions of the, the New King James won't have this because they're just a very economy type of Bible. But you get a little better one that has marginal notes and footnotes, and uh, you, you go down the, the, the margin in, in the New Testament, and over and over and over again it says N-U, N-U, N-U. And what the New King James uh, translators did and editors did uh, is as they made changes between the Old King James and the New King James, they often would go to the, the liberal NU text, the critical text, to make their adjustments. Uh, uh, no thank you to the King James Version, or the New King James Version, folks. But again, these all are based on Dr. Westcott and Dr. Hort, which is based on Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which, as incidentally, are fakes. But it goes back ultimately to Gnostic heresy. Well, Dr. Metzger passed the scene here some years ago. Uh, the Kirtalan has passed the scene. And there is a, another American textual scholar who continues their work. His name is Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman, in his college years, attended Moody Bible Institute in Chicago when they then would agree to be called a fundamentalist institution. They don't today. Uh, they call themselves evangelical, and there is a distinction. Uh, we won't get into that here tonight. But Ehrman went to Moody and came out of Moody as a fundamentalist. And then he went to Wheaton College in the western suburbs of Chicago, and uh, Wheaton College is from the, almost day one been a new evangelical college, and, and uh, Ehrman became a new evangelical. Now, you pastors know what I'm talking about, but it's a declension now theologically. Moving further and further to the left, in other words, becoming more liberal. And then Bart Ehrman uh, went to Princeton Theological Seminary in New Jersey to get his Ph.D., and sat under the feet of none other than Bruce Metzger, and he became a liberal. Today, uh, Bruce Metzger is uh, the, the chair of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, Theology Department. And today, Bruce Metzger calls himself an agnostic. Uh, Bart Ehrman, I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you, brother. Bart Ehrman today calls himself an agnostic. He went from being a fundamentalist to a new evangelical to a liberal to an agnostic. Uh, an agnostic is one who says, we don't know. It's, it's the, the one notch above being an atheist. Right. And Ehrman said that if God inspired the Bible, then he surely would have preserved it. But since he did not preserve it, he did not inspire it either. Now God did inspire and he did preserve. But then Urban went on record as saying, this God, if he exists, cannot be Jesus Christ or the God of the Bible. Now folks, Sadly and tragically, Bart Ehrman reflects the logical conclusion of the critical text philosophy. Of an uncertainty, we don't know what the Bible really says, we don't know what the New Testament really says, we're still trying to figure it out, still trying to recover it. And he ultimately wind up where he, was, where, he, where he wound up. And that is a blasphemous conclusion. I do not believe that God entrusted the transmission and the editing of His Word to the prophets of Baal. And I also do not believe that the New Testament has come to us through the lineage of the modern critical text editors. And there is a record of the traditional text right back to the church in Antioch. Oh, Brother Sorensen, don't you know that there aren't any, there isn't manuscript evidence? No, folks, there is translational evidence. There is some manuscript, but there's strong translational evidence going back to the church at Antioch of the traditional text of the received text. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that uh, if the, the Peshitta translation with the, the Syrian churches 
under the leadership of the church at Antioch, if, if the Peshitta translation follows the traditional text, folks, it was translated from the traditional text. It's the Word of God. The received text, the traditional text, is the Word of God. The Westcott Hort text, its successors, and all its translations are counterfeit. It's as simple as that. Let's touch not the unclean thing, folks, and adhere to the truth. I know we've, where I've gone tonight has been largely negative, and I'd, maybe next year I'll get on the positive. But uh, <laughs> The critical text, young people, is connected with apostasy from start to finish. Yes. And if for no other reason, that's reason enough to have nothing to do with it. Father, tonight, thank you. You've given us the truth. Thank you that thy word is truth. Thank you that we can have confidence in the absolute authority of your word and, and in the English language, our King James Bible. Now, bless us. This meeting continues tonight, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.